and both cannot be comprehended simultaneously. So what's Patanjali referring to here? Well, we have to look to the previous sutras, sutras 18 and 19. Sutra 19 was referring to the mutability of the self and how the self cannot know itself. It cannot be a knowable object. The point here being is if you think you have realized the self, then you have to be very careful because it is not an object. So if you think you've discovered it, you have to be very careful not to characterize it as an entity of some kind because it's that which does the illumination. Now, the traditional understanding of enlightenment is that once you've reached it, that's that. But enlightenment is about the attention. The attention moves around all over the place. You can do exercises to try and focus it in one place. You might have to focus it in one place if you've got a task to perform. But otherwise it likes to flit around all over the place. Samadhi is when it's resting in its own nature. It's not knowing itself. It's resting in its own nature. I sometimes describe this as paying attention to the attention. And somebody pointed out that well, this involves some kind of infinite regression. But that's only if you're thinking of, thinking of it conceptually. When you're aware of the awareness, paying attention to the attention, then it collapses in and itself. The seer and the seen, mentioned later on in Sutra 23, collapse into just the seeing. So what's Sutra 20 about? Well, like I said, the traditional understanding of enlightenment is that once you're there, that's it. It's not. Enlightenment is the beginning of spiritual practice, not the end of it. So this is why I call it enlightenment practice. Enlightenment is something you keep coming back to. You cannot actually be enlightened when you're engaging with the world. Because then you have to put the attention away from itself. You have to put it out there or in here. It's no longer resting in itself. Enlightenment, successful enlightenment practice, is being able to bring the attention back to itself, coming back to samadhi whenever there's no need to be doing something, even if you're very, very busy. This doesn't mean that busy people cannot be enlightened because even when you're busy with tasks, you can, there are still lots and lots of opportunities to bring the attention back to itself. It only takes a few seconds, a few microseconds even. There's lots of gaps in any task where you can be bringing, bringing the attention back to itself. So there's no excuse being busy is not an excuse to not be practicing. In fact, it's even more essential to be practicing when you're busy. So this is a very important point. Enlightenment comes and goes. When you become more adept at it, then there's less chance of you losing the plot. Although we have to be careful that it stays fresh and, and it doesn't become a knowable object, as it said in Sutra 19. It's all about making the transition, which this book has been all about, from the great flow of life to this other dimension. 
The great flow of life is the great flow of our moods. And we can move to this other dimension, which is beyond our moods, which can see the moods happening, but doesn't get sucked into them, doesn't fuel them, but remains in its own dimension. And just to be quite clear about this, Sutra 21 tells us, if one mindset or mood could bring another into its purview, then there would be infinite regression, because the mind would be working on the mind. There would be confusion in self-remembering. So this is it, isn't it? This is what spiritual seekers are up against. They're trying to deal with the mind. So they'll do all sorts of things, all sorts of mind-body practice to work on their mind and their body. And that's all very well. That's nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's got nothing to do with enlightenment. You might feel very good doing all that, and that's great. And you might be living what you might regard as spiritual lifestyle. You might even feel you're experiencing higher states. But this is nothing. This is all just part of the flow of moods. One mood cannot deal with another mood. Perhaps Sutra 20 could be understood in this context, actually. Two moods cannot be experienced at the same time. It's a bit like trying to give up smoking or an addiction or, or a fetish of some kind. There'll be times where you think, yes, this isn't good for me, I have to give it up. And you're quite sure about this. You don't want to have anything to do with that kind of behaviour. But then what happens is, at a certain point, that mood presents itself. The mood whereby you're in some grip of whatever addiction or fetish or state of irritability or depression or whatever. It comes along anyway, no matter what your you no matter what your good intentions were. Now this doesn't mean to say that you should give up on trying to alter your moods. There's all sorts of good practices and therapies out there, I'm sure. You can throw some new moods into the mix and all the rest of it. So this is infinite regression. You're just getting caught up in the cycle of moods once again creating more moods, one mood leading to another mood. That's not what we're about. We are about self-remembering. Remembering the self, coming back to the self. And we mustn't confuse this with coming back to a particular kind of good mood. This is why it's called dispassion. It's sometimes described in rather cold terms, void, emptiness. What we have to do is move into this other dimension. The dimension of the self, the dimension of awareness. Samadhi.